So that part of it seems to work. Uh, well, I guess you'll have to do it with that. My video feed I can switch back to that in a second as well. So yeah, um, hi everybody. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, having me here today. Uh, Matt asked me to uh, say a few words about PyBricks. So a few slides and uh, yeah, curious to hear what you guys think as well. And uh, feel free to ask any questions either during or after. So um, let's see, yeah. Perhaps uh, kicking it off with a little bit of history. So I'm working on PyBricks uh, together with David Lechner from the USA. Myself, I'm from the Netherlands. So that's why I was able to join today, but not David, he's probably still asleep at this hour. Um, but yeah, before we uh, did PyBricks, we've been longtime Lego fans uh, before as well. David is perhaps uh, best known for creating EV3 dev, that's Debian Linux for the previous Mindstorms EV3. And around that time, I was working on several how to code books for Mindstorms, NXT, and EV3. But that was all still with the block coding languages from Lego, not with, with MicroPython. And uh, yeah, so I guess around 2018, we kind of teamed up to, uh, to create PyBricks. We wanted to uh, yeah, really improve the robotics experience and text-based coding for Mindstorms and all these other platforms. Uh, yeah, and make robotics a bit simpler with, without making it simplistic. And with that, I mean, so not necessarily to dumb it down, but to make it like really easy to accurately control motors and sensors uh, without having to say, implement your own PID controller or something but just make it really easy to have a drive phase, accurately drive back and forth or make 90 degree turns uh, and so on. So yeah, and initially we started with, uh, well, several platforms, but EV3 was our first release. So that's based on the MicroPython Unix port. Um, and that's one we eventually did together with Lego Education as well. So if you uh, go to the Lego website and download what they call the uh, Python for EV3, that's actually uh, MicroPython together with PyBricks. Uh, based on the Unix port. Um, but before that was released, we kind of started off on other platforms as well. Um, and this was also, I think, in 2018 when that uh, uh, boost set came out, I realized it had a M32 uh, chip on board. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun to try and run MicroPython on this thing? And uh, just for context, at that time, I'd never even, I, I didn't know what a make file was or a linker file. so let alone how to write one. So that was fun, uh, yeah, learning to play with that. So I got myself a few of those uh, Nucleo uh, boards, one of them with that exact chip, but then also one with an STM32 F4 that already existed as a port for MicroPython so I could start off with something that worked. Um, yeah, I eventually got the minimal port running uh, on this Nucleo board. And then, yeah, I kind of reached out to David to see if he was, if he was interested, and he certainly was. So. Then he pretty much figured out the Bluetooth protocol to uh, upload the firmware to that hub because unlike the nuclear board, this one does not have convenient uh, debugging uh, pins that you can just uh, attach to. But yeah, so we figured it out and eventually uh, I got it all running. And so, yeah, you can see that quote here on the screen. That was one of those other uh, things that maybe uh, triggered it initially. I think somebody on the GitHub uh, issues asked if MicroPython could run on that port. And that was, I guess, around at the time that F0 was being supported. So yeah, but that was was supposed to be straightforward. And I guess here we are, so it's running now. Uh, but yeah, this was a fun puzzle, especially with the amount of flash available. So this has 108 kilobytes, and that's because there's a 20 kilobyte bootloader as well that you can get rid of. Uh, but yeah, it fits and it works. And uh, a few years later, we now do support uh, all of them as well. So no longer just the boost move hub that you're just seeing, but also the ones that comes in the trains, the ones that come in the Technic sets, and then those three at the bottom as well. Those are the Mindstorms and Spike hubs. And those are pretty close to uh, uh, the original Pi boards, including USB and DFU support as well. Whereas the ones at the top only have uh, BOE. Um, and then, yeah, aside from that, we still also support the uh, EV3 version as well uh, through a different editor. So the, yeah, the ones on the left, we also support through our web app, which I'll uh, share with you guys in a moment. Uh, but the other one is still supported through VS Code because it, yeah, it's Linux. All right, so 
yeah, besides those hubs, uh, we try to support all of these motors and sensors as well. So uh, there is motors in various shapes and sizes. There is various lights, color sensors, distance sensors, force sensors. And then there's also the uh, Bluetooth remote at the top left as well. And uh, yeah, Matt also asked in advance, so what are the differences then with the, with the Lego apps? There's, there's quite a few differences, but in the context of this uh, slide is we try to make everything compatible. So normally when you get one of those sets, you get one of those hubs with one or two motors, and the app is really focused on the play experience with, with that set, which is great, of course, but uh, if you want to combine all the elements you have, uh, then it's some, sometimes a bit harder to use uh, to stay with those apps because not everything is supported. Uh, so what we try to do is we'll make the behavior of all the hubs pretty much the same and all the motors and sensors uh, work. So if the, if the plug fits, then it should, uh, should more or less work. Um, I guess then the question is, what can you make? Well, and this is perhaps an area where it diverges a little bit from your typical MicroPython project because there's no electronics involved. There's, uh, yeah, no PCBs exposed, it's just Lego elements. And so you guys, you can get as creative as you like. And this is, uh, yeah, one of many examples you can find online. So uh, also in the train community, uh, it's gaining popularity as well, because normally when you get one of these trains, you have to drive it with the remote that comes in the box or with your phone. Uh, but if you close the app or the remote goes out of range, the train just stops. And so one of the simplest use cases, if you just want to run your trains, you do a few lines of MicroPython on the hub uh, to basically start the motor and then just wait in the infinite loop and the train will just yeah run happily until the batteries uh, burn out. Or as in this example, uh, you can put a color sensor in the base so we can see the little colors in the tracks so it knows where it is, uh, maybe where to stop uh, and so on as well. Um, but of course you can also make robotics uh, applications. Here's a fun example where somebody made uh, yeah, a potter using the Mindstorms uh, set in this case, but with a bunch of Technic sets um, added as well. Um, yeah, and another little difference here then is uh, the performance on the hub because we originally made it to run on these, yeah, the really tiny hub with very little space and RAM. Uh, it was all pretty lightweight, but that also means if you run it on one of those faster hubs, uh, things do run quite a lot faster than the original firmware uh, because there's no runtime to, ru to load from the flash. Everything just uh, yeah, runs on the main processor, basically. Uh, so you get about uh, three times as much RAM and uh, yeah, about also three times higher Pystone score compared to the original firmware. Um, but then in addition to yeah, making anything with any element, uh, we also try to offer projects you can do with uh, one site at a time. So we've got a projects website where uh, people can submit their own projects for existing Lego sets. So they can do that by providing a, a script and a markdown file with a bit of text in the description and pictures. Uh, they can make a pull request and then it gets automatically rendered uh, on the website. So, and that way we yeah, try to encourage people to just submit projects. And that's also an easy entry point for people who don't necessarily know how to code yet. Or they can just yeah, go to the site, copy the code and load it onto the hub and yeah, make it run around autonomously or with the remote uh, and so on. Um, yeah, since we're all MicroPython developers here, I thought maybe I had one slide to share where it sort of fits in an ecosystem. So, uh, it's not a fork, so we try to stick as closely as possible to MicroPython when we can. Uh, so we use the same built-in MicroPython modules, but that's uh, as far as it's allowed by the uh, size of the flash. So the Boost Move Hub has almost nothing enabled, but the other hubs uh, can have a bit more. Um, and in addition to that, there's there's one Pyrex package that we have in all of the hubs, um, which includes modules and classes to interface with uh, all of the sensors. Um, all right. Yeah, so I also prepared a little bit of a demo uh, if there's time. Um, so most of the things you can do from within the um, 
web app, which is hosted at code.pybricks.com, or in this case, it's the beta version, so beta.pybricks.com. So I'll switch over to that screen, uh, switch a little bit on what that looks like, and I'll also try and run that thing as well. Um, all right, yeah, there's the app. Okay, so this is uh, Pybrix code. That's the web app, uh, which after you've loaded it for the first time, everything runs offline. So you can also save it as a Chrome app if you like. Um, yeah, and use it offline as well. It's yeah, kind of a really simple editor, uh, but it does uh, it, the basics. Um, we might at some point maybe also add a VS Code extension or something, but for now, uh, for beginning users, this is kind of an easy entry point. Uh, you can make little scripts, uh, you can open them, and as of uh, since the recent update, you can also import stuff from other uh, files as well. So you can make your uh, multi-file scripts. So when you normally first uh, use the app, the first thing you normally do is install the firmware. So maybe I'll just go through those steps. In this case, I'm going to do one of the uh, spy cops as an example, which has DFU, which is a little quicker than the uh, Bluetooth update. Uh, but here's how you do that. Uh, so you go to the settings menu, and you click install Pybrix firmware. At this point, you can uh, select which hub you have. Uh, and we're still working on improving this UI, so you can just click on a picture. In this case, I'm going to pick the Spy Prime hub. You can read the open source license if you like. Um, and then there's a few options to configure the hub. For this one, it's just a hub name. Um, which gets baked into the firmware. And this is basically the Bluetooth name. And this is useful if you have a classroom with like 10 of these things so that they don't all have the same name. And you want to do that during the firmware update so you don't have to connect to them afterwards only to change the name and then connect again. So but I'm just going to leave it in the default in this case. There's a few instructions to get the hub into DFU mode. And then you can connect with uh, web view in this case, web USB. And then it'll go and install uh, firmware. And of course, you could also use DFU util uh, instead as well. And now the yeah, firmware is loaded onto the hub, so it's running. And you can connect to it through Bluetooth. And uh, yeah, now you can run your, uh, run your scripts. We've got an example here with a drive base. And I guess if I turn on my camera, well, I'll do that later. But so basically, you can just, yeah, from your script, you get loaded onto the hub. Um, and you can hear it in the background. Uh, the robot is now uh, driving around. Uh, you can stop the script as well. And if you like, there's also the uh, REPL you can use. And this is perhaps also a bit of a slight difference with your typical MicroPython boards. Um, so we don't normally start up in the REPL. In this case, the REPL uh, behaves as if it's any other program that's being run. Um, the thinking behind that is that it's always easy to stop. So if you start a motor in the REPL, you can still always click stop and everything will just safely uh, stop so that your robot doesn't run off the table uh, or, or worse. Um, yeah, um, so I guess I can switch over to the, the robot demo in this case. Uh, that is going to be a ball balancing robot. Uh, this is the entire code. Uh, what it is basically, I'll just stick to the main loop. That's the main part. Um, there's a balancer class uh, that is, is used to balance a normally a two wheeled kind of Sequoia-like robot. But in this case, there's two copies of them, one for each axis of the ball robot. And that's just being run in a infinite loop. Uh, so I'm going to switch over the camera to the demo table. And I wonder if it's possible for somebody to switch over the camera feed, or I can do that on this end. Let's see. Uh, 
right? So, can you guys see this? We can, but if you stop sharing, we can make it larger. All right, I'll go and do that. On the other screen. All right, is that better? It's not focused yet, but uh, I'll just launch the robot in the meantime. And for this one, it's easier to launch it with two hands, so. All right. Here it goes. So this is running the Mindstorms hub, which is the same as the Spike Prime hub, it's just a different color. Um, and it is standing on, uh, on the ball using two motors. So as I mentioned, they're like driven by two separate axes, which is a good enough of an extra uh, approximation to make it work. Oh no. <laughs> yep, that also happens. Uh, but this is where it's, as I mentioned, easy to press the stop button um, to safely stop, all right. But it's Lego, so it's easy enough to, uh, to repair. Uh, back to the other screen. Uh, yeah, so because if there's any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to go over those or maybe show around a little more. And they also have one question for the MicroPython devs as well on the slides. So we can go back to that afterwards as well. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Lawrence. That's, that's, it's, um, it's, it's good for me to see this. It's, it's, um, to see a good overview like this. It's very, it was very nice. Thanks. Um, do you have, so you run a Bluetooth server on the hub when it, puts Pybrick's firmware on there, I assume. And as in um, a Bluetooth server that your computer can connect to and that server allows you to download things and also be a REPL, is that right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, we also made a few changes recently to that. Basically right now there's uh, three characteristics. Uh, yeah, by the way, I should add all that is implemented kind of uh, in the firmware, so not through uh, MicroPython itself, so not through your Bluetooth. Right, yep. Uh, there's one characteristic to uh, download and run. So that's basically what operates uh, these two buttons. There's one to get uh, information about the hub. So for example, the firmware version, which MPY format is supported uh, because we cross compile the programs uh, in here, either with version five or six, depending on which firmware is connected. Um, so that's, two correct, that's those two characteristics. And then the third one is the Nordic UART service, uh, which is uh, basically used for standard IO. So including the REPL, for instance, and that's kind of a standard one. So uh, yeah, I've actually pushed a tutorial out last week uh, where we also show how you can connect to that without our own apps and with your own tools. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to just preload a program on here, which would use, I think it's even on here, yeah, uh, which would use uh, standard in and out uh, to get data in and out of the standard out. And then instead of connecting it afterwards with Hybrix code, you could use any other tool or even a MicroPython board to connect to the Nordic UI service and just, uh, yeah, read standard in and out or connect to the REPL as well. Yep. Um, yeah, so it depends a little bit on, on what you'd like to do. And we're still actively working on Bluetooth. It's pretty straightforward on the Spike Hubs with a BT stack with full control of everything. It's much more tricky on the other hubs, uh, which have a the Bluetooth stack running on an external chip on different ones on each hub, uh, which aren't always as nicely documented. Uh, so we, yeah, adding more and more features makes it a bit more uh, tricky to get everything to to work right and not run out of RAM on the Bluetooth chip, for instance. Um, but also, so, sorry. Yeah, so so basically, it's 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 a, a generic firmware, and then we run MicroPython as an application on top, as opposed to MicroPython driving the entire 
uh, system like they do on the STM32 boards. Yep. So yeah, so we use yeah MicroPython as a soft module as the application basically. Yeah, and uh, I think at this point, we're kind of finally caught up with all the hubs that have been released over the years. Uh, more and more hubs kept coming out. And uh, these three are the, the most recent additions with uh, where we had to use uh, WebDFU uh, because unlike these hubs, these ones don't have a BLE bootloader. Uh, so you know, it requires some extra work to get them all running. Uh, Everything else though is pretty similar between the hubs. Uh, so this is the least powerful, but still runs pretty much the same thing, just with less features enabled. Uh, but they still all have the same uh, interface. So just for context, for instance, the Boost Hub doesn't have a REPL enabled, and it also doesn't support floating point, because both of those are almost 20 kilobytes. And uh, I can, I can bring up. Yeah, so we uh, keep track of the build size, uh, especially for move up over time, and I guess I should zoom out for context. Um, this is everything uh, back in time. Uh, the ones with zero are just build errors uh, that we didn't take care of at the time. But uh, you'll notice that usually it just grows for a while, and then we uh, you know, have to optimize or remove features, so it drops, and we get to add new features again and again and again, and we have to optimize again. And this big one, I think, is probably where we either disable to REPL or, uh, just a second, Let me zoom this out. Yeah, that's where we disabled uh, floating point support, for instance. But uh, we're now at a point where pretty much all of the motors and sensors are supported. So, uh, and we are 102 kilobytes, give or take. So we have a bit of uh, space to spare, but which is currently also used to store the user program as well. Um, and that is also a uh, fairly recent feature is that we now allow programs to be stored on these three hubs as well, even though they don't have an external file system. And that's actually partially made possible by the new MPY6 format, because uh, basically we can keep the MPY script in RAM uh, without duplicating it as we load it now. So keeping it in RAM isn't an extra expense. Normally that left little RAM for the user to still work with, but now we can just keep it around and then save it to uh, internal flash as we power off. Those are typically blocking operations, so it's not great to do that while they're running, but it's okay to do that during power off. Um, and yeah, that way we can use the last couple of pages to, uh, to store a program on those hubs as well. And yeah, the other thing that the new MicroPython 6 format enabled us to do is uh, made a yeah, uh, implementation of multi files. So, Whenever the user uh, imports something, so for example, on this script, they import a function from this module. So the, the app here detects that, and it appends all the MPY files together with a, a size uh, as well. And then on the yeah, MicroPython side on the hub, uh, when the user requests to imports it, it looks for that concatenation of MPY files and, and, and uh, yeah, imports it, and that's thanks to that uh, pull request. Uh, you helped merge Damien, thanks for that. Um, to make that possible without the whole feature of external imports enabled, because that's somewhat costly for this hub in particular. So we end up with something that yeah does most of the things that our users would like to do without yeah while trying to keep the size down basically. So thanks for uh, yeah getting that merged in. Um, yeah, so perhaps to, to close off as well, I had one question for you as well. Um, as I mentioned, we'd like to be able to exit the program cleanly uh, in all circumstances. So 
put together this monster on the left. Uh, and my question then is, uh, is there something like MP exit or something equivalent to that to sort of get out of it? So um, typically that's when the stop button is pressed or when the battery is, is, is nearly uh, about to die. We want to safely uh, turn the hub off and ex exit the script. And I mean, there's various ways to do it. Of course, you could, could long jump to the end of it or in this attempt, um, I've tried to make it work through MicroPython. So to uh, yeah, pop the NLR, except for the last one, and then uh, raise the exception again, uh, so it exits. So that works, but I'm not at all sure that that's the best way to do it, uh, or if there's even a, an easier way to, uh, to somehow get out of this. Uh, yeah, I did uh, um, recently think about this. Um, we need an exception that you can raise that's uncatchable basically by python yeah. right and that's kind of what you've done there by deleting all of the inner nlr yeah. catches um but yeah we we need to to make this work i think the only way to do it is to have a a new exception type which isn't inherited from anything existing and which is like a um system abort or something system abort yeah. and if the vm catches one of these it does not allow it to pass to python it, it must re-raise and so that will yeah. propagate up and up and up and up and only the only c code could catch it if it explicitly wanted to so you could write some code which yeah. caught it at the very top level so wouldn't yeah that's what would be necessary yeah that would be really useful yeah anything that can't be caught that is bare except uh yeah could then be handled cool um, all right. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that as well. So yeah. Any other questions? Uh, you covered everything that I was. So does anybody have any Lego hubs? I guess I wanted to ask as well. No, but I want some. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Lawrence, yeah, okay. you know that I do. I still need to get back and, uh, and play with mine some more with your pipe brick stuff. What's the one at the bottom bottom right of that court of that picture you've got the the small yellow one that looks like the spike one? Yeah, yeah. that's the spike essential. So the big one is called spike prime. It's I think, oh okay. Tools yeah. and spike essential is is aimed at even younger kids. Uh, in terms of oh, hardware right. though, they're uh, pretty similar. It has it only two uh, port stones. So depending on what you want to do, uh, yeah, it may or may not work. But uh, otherwise, it's yeah, pretty similar. So I think I'm just going to scroll back to this page as well. So that set comes with this little motor. So it's really aimed at smaller things you can build, less torque. You don't want to hurt your fingers as you play with it. Um, it also comes with more uh, standard brick elements instead of uh, Technic. Uh, so it's, it's fun to play with. But uh, yeah, in terms of capabilities, if you're looking for the more affordable option on that one, this one might do fine for, for many things. It's also got two ports. This is the one that comes with most of the trains. Uh, but if you don't need some of the more advanced features from this one, then this one will work. And I think Matt also asked which one to get. I think if <laughs> budget is less of an issue, probably one of these, especially if you want to update the firmware like three times an hour, then DFU is just the quickest way to do it. Uh, so yeah, if you want to go build custom firmwares, maybe get one of those, but yeah, in terms of maybe value for money, perhaps any of the Technic sets, and I guess pick one that comes with a few motors as well. And then separately from that, there's this sensor. I wonder if you can see the cursor, but I think this one sells for about 15 US dollars. It's a nice little color sensor that also duplicates as a distance sensor as well. It do does a lot of things for you. For the price so yeah so get one of these with a few motors in the box and then separately this one as well and then you're I guess good to go uh, and if you want a Bluetooth remote get this one as well which normally comes in the, in the train box uh, yeah I think so far we've actively engaged with the Lego community but yeah it would be cool to see what uh, MicroPython users uh, 
yeah, would come up with as well. Yeah, Maybe. Read it too. It's like the docs yeah. are great, really good, yeah. Yeah, I just want to add, so maybe long-term we'll also support more custom hardware as well. Right now we've really focused on the ones you can just plug in, but maybe someday we could also allow, like use I squared C modules or UART modules directly through the, uh, through the ports. And maybe one final thing to show that like, relevant for MicroPython as well. One thing we've been trying to do is of course, document our own modules, but we're also trying to uh, make uh, some of the MicroPython modules documented a bit in more, slight more detail, but also in a way that's still easy enough to follow. So sometimes we prioritize easy, making things easy to read as opposed to making it entirely correct in terms of uh, typing and, and so on. Um, yeah, so we're, and this is still a work in progress to document. I think this one is already done. Um, so we've got the stops library with all the modules that is used to generate this documentation and which is also used for uh, typing and autocompleting the browser. So uh, if we do uh, well, this doesn't have any It's also a work in progress. We currently use Jedi in the browser uh, to do autocomplete. It's not as not quite as fancy as the VS Code in Telsons with PyLens, but uh, it, yeah, it, uh, it does help. That's great. And yeah, I mean, this of course is, is also available. I don't know, I, I know there's a lot of work going on in the MicroPython documentation, but I would be happy to contribute this back if there's any interest in that. Uh, and having that in the long term as well. Good. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for that. It was really yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Lawrence is getting his uh, yeah. involvement. Yeah. I was like, I mean, they didn't like stop pushing it around. Like, yeah, yeah. Because they have the dungeon deliver up. See, that's impressed me a lot more than the Tesla humanoid bike, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I would be hands on the Wow, you're so the wrong thing fast as helping. I thought I said, though, like, he's got quite a large delay in the loop as well. So it's not even pushing the mic. Incredible. That's really cool. <clears throat> so, now my news ran up a little. Uh, it's hard to follow that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, uh, it's, All right, let's get going again, guys. Cause I'll always be here all night. <laughs> we can um, watch it again. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah keep in. Just use it. Yeah, let's <laughs> <laughs> <That's laughs> see how this works. Um, Do you want to sleep? You. It's fine. I've eaten enough. It's okay. Uh, I'm gonna get started, folks.